Hi, my name is Carmen Miller Carger. We are talking about fundamentals of mechanical vibrations and we, today we will cover the topic harmonic motion. This is part of the chapter one of our textbook, Single Race Row, Mechanical Vibrations. And some of the figures and content are adapted from the book. The learning objective of these presentations are the following. We will characterize the harmonic motion and the different possible representations. We will add and subtract harmonic motion, and we will introduce the Fourier series expansions of a given periodic function. We define harmonic motion or periodic motion as a function that repeats itself after equal intervals of time. We have one cycle, which is the movement from one position going to the other direction and returning to the same position. The amplitude is the displacement of the vibration body from its equilibrium position which to the maximum value of the function. We have the period of oscillation, which is the time that it takes to complete a cycle of motion and is denoted by sometimes like tau or capital T. And then we have the frequency of oscillation, which is the number of cycles per unit of time. And that will be one over the period of oscillation. And we have a circular frequency of oscillation, which is denoted by omega, and is two pi the frequency of oscillation, or two pi divided by the period. The most basic harmonic functions are the sine and cosine. Let's talk about the sine first. This is the function that represents the sine and it starts at zero. This is one cycle from here to here. It could be measured also from here to here. The amplitude is from zero to the maximum value. And this is a function graph respect to time. The cosine function starts at one and goes all the way here, and that will be a cycle that can be measured from any peak to another peak. As you see, the sine and cosine are uh, similar functions. They have a phase angle between each other of 90 degrees. It means that the peak of the cosine function occurs 90 degrees before the peak of the sine function. We can relate the sine of and the cosine by just adding a phase angle of by half or 90 degrees. If the response of our system is in terms of cosine, that will be the displacement of the system, this will be the curve that represents the displacement, the velocity will be the derivative of the displacement, therefore it will be this function right here. We can represent it with a sine function or with a cosine function. This will be our velocity and the amplitude will be the amplitude times the internal derivative, which is the angular velocity. And we, if we do the acceleration, will be the derivative of the velocity. And then the amplitude will be the initial amplitude times the angular velocity squared cosine. And this function has a phase angle of 180 degrees respect to the displacement. If we do the Taylor expansion of the sine and the cosine functions, we get this expression right here for the sine function, and we get this expression right here for the cosine function. This will be very useful when we want to linearize the system for small values of angular displacement, small angles of theta. We can say that the sine function approach to theta and the cosine function approach to one. When we talk about synchronous harmonic motion, it means that it has the same frequency or angular velocity, not need to have the same amplitude, and not need to attain their maximum values at the same time. So it could have a phase angle. The phase angle means that the maximum of the second vector would occur phi radians before first vector. So if we graph that, we'd say that these two curves will be synchronous because, as you see, have the same period, they have different amplitudes, and they can have a phase angle between each other. The vectorial representation will be this vector has an angle of phi respect to the first one. Any vector in the plane x, y can be expressed in terms of a complex number. In this figure, we see that this is the real part and this is the imaginary part. 
and we can express our vector as a plus ib. The magnitude, of course, will be a squared plus b squared, square root of that. And using the Euler form, we can expand this expression in terms of cosine and sine. If we express the motion of a system in terms of our Euler form, then this will be the expressions, the first derivative and the second derivative. The displacement will be the real part of the expression of motion, the velocity will be the real part of the first derivative, and the acceleration will be the real part of the second derivative. As you see, those expressions are similar to the ones that we already analyzed. To analyze the motion of a system that is subjected to harmonic motions, in many cases we have to add different harmonic functions. Let's recall these trigonometric identities of the sum of two angles and the sine and the cosine. So if we want to add two harmonic motions, we have to apply these expressions. So for example, if we want to add x1 and x2, we will have a cosine of omega t plus a2 sine of omega t. And as you see, we can express this expression in terms of a single cosine function. If we expand this expression using our trigonometric identity, we can relate the phase angle and the a value, which is the amplitude of that single cosine function, with our original a1 and a2. And as you see, the single amplitude will be the square root of a1 squared plus b a2 squared and the phase angle alpha will be the inverse tangent of a2 over a1. Therefore, there's two ways to write a harmonic function, either by two sine and cosine functions or by a single cosine function with a phase angle. And here we find the phase angle, and here we relate this amplitude to the two original amplitudes. The phenomenon of beats occurs when adding two harmonic motions with frequencies close to one another. As you see, here we have the first harmonic motion with omega as a frequency, and then we have the second one is omega plus delta. If this delta is very small, and recall the trigonometric identities, and we use this expression, the first one over here, we see that we add a plus b divided by 2, in this case will be omega plus omega plus delta, so it will be 2 omega plus delta divided by 2, and a minus b2, it will be omega minus omega minus delta, so at the end we have this expression right here. If we graph this expression, we get something like this. It means this one, this function, is represented by the orange graph, and this one right here will be the amplitude of the this function. And as you see, it will go to zero, to a maximum value, and then to zero again, and to a maximum value. This green function completes a cycle from here all the way to here. So, but a bit cycle, whenever we have two peaks, it will be half of the period of this function. The physical interpretation of a Fourier series is that any periodic function can be represented as the sum of harmonic functions. This is a periodic function because it repeats itself after a period of time. Although a series is an infinite sum, most of periodic functions can be represented with the help of few functions. For example, this function over here, which is a triangular wave, can be represented closely by adding three harmonic functions. We have what is called the Gibbs phenomenon 
that when a periodic function is represented by a Fourier series, is an anomalous behavior can be observed. So here we have an error in the peak. And even though we can increase the number of functions, we will never be able to represent this sharp corner. So when we increase the number of functions, the approximation can be seen to be improved everywhere but in the discontinuity. The coefficients of the Fourier series can be found with these expressions right here, where the function f t is the one that we want to represent. The Fourier series can also be represented by the sum of a single sine terms or single cosine terms when we use a phase angle. And in that case, the coefficients will be found using these expressions, which an and bn are the ones from the previous slide. The Fourier series can also be represented with complex number using the Euler form. Cosine can be represented by the adding two exponential functions or and the sine subtracting two exponential functions. If we substitute the cosine and the sine in our Fourier series and this one algebra, we can get this expression right here, and this will be the coefficients. The Fourier series expansion permits the description of any periodic function either in the time domain, which is this one right here, we, we have studied in this presentation, and also in the frequency domain. And in the frequency domain, this value right here will represent the amplitude. So, a single sine function will be represented only by one value. But if we have several functions, several harmonic functions that represent a, my periodic function, I will have as many values as harmonic functions I use to represent my original function. We will see in the examples that we will develop that some computational effort can be minimized when the function is recognized as if or as odd. Remember that an even function is a symmetric function about the origin so that the function respect to t is equal to the function of negative t. For example, the cosine is an even function. And in the case of Fourier series expansion, when a function is even, can be represented by only cosine terms. In the case of a own function, it satisfies the relation of that a function is equal to the negative when I use negative values of t. For example, the sine function is an odd function. And in this case, the Fourier series expansion can be represented only by sine terms. With this slide, I conclude the presentation for harmonic motion. We will do some examples to put in practice all these concepts that we have learned today.